morning. I'm gonna go ahead and start. Good morning, my name is Dr. Megan Johnson. Uh, I was thinking this morning about little kids. So I, you know, you'll, you'll figure it out, but I have a prosthesis on. I had 15 knee surgeries. And by, we, by the time we got to 15, I was like, you know what? I see people like climbing mountains and beating people in the Olympics on fake legs. Like, cut this one off and give me one of them. Let me, give me a chance to do that. So kids are a trip, you know, kids will just stare at me. They want to know, you know, I'll be sitting in the barber shop or at the grocery store or whatever, limping, and, and kids pay closer attention than adults. You know, most people just think I got to limp or whatever. But little kids will stare. And so I started telling little kids, they, they would ask, like, Mister, why, why is your leg so skinny? Or what, what happened to your leg or whatever? Especially if I have on shorts. And I'm like, look, I ain't supposed to tell you this, but I'm a superhero. Right? You heard of Cyborg? I'm Cyborg Daddy. And, but I'm old now, so they're taking my stuff away. Now I got the, the cheap piece of equipment or whatever, and I come up with these elaborate stories. And so with the parents, half of it is like, you know, stop telling my child this stuff. Like, it's Mister, don't, don't feed my child fairy tales. And the other half is like, oh my God, he's been obsessed with you since we've been here at the car wash. He's been wanting to know. You know, and then, they, of course, they'll go and tell everybody there uh, that they met, you know, Cyborg Daddy or whatever. <laughs> Right? And it's just a thing, right? It's just a thing that I've adopted over time. Um, you know, when, when thinking about stuff that happens to us and, and how we uh, maneuver and navigate through becoming, you know, scholars or becoming professionals or whatever. There's some handouts back in the back, a couple of sheets and some pens if you need them. Yeah. Like I said, I am Dr. Lincoln Johnson. I grew up in the great city of Compton, California uh, about a month ago. Got the seat represented to the world, Compton Boulevard, sitting in the middle of SoFi Stadium, right? Uh, changed my life. I'm a 50 year old man. I just turned 50 yesterday. So happy birthday to me. I'm still celebrating. Thank you, thank you. I'll take it. And so, um, growing up in Compton uh, was a little different for me because I grew up in the hood middle class. My mom was a teacher. She grew up in a small town in Ozona, Texas. You never heard of it. It's got like two exits. You miss the second exit, you gotta go 23 miles to San Angelo and then turn around and get back on. That's how small the town is. You gotta be looking at for the exits too, because ain't no signs to say like, get off here. That's how small the town is. And so um, she went to school in a red barn schoolhouse. I don't know, you youngsters probably don't even know what that is. When me growing up, the image of a school was always this red, barn looking place. She actually went to school in one of those. And so her whole town had 55 students in it. And they all went to school in this giant room, kindergarten to 12th grade. And they had the older kids teach the younger kids. And so um, when she got older, you know, when she was in high school or whatever, they became the teachers for the younger kids. So that made her want to be a teacher. Uh, everybody was moving to California, right? Liberal, get away from the South, whatever. They were still picking cotton in the 50s and 60s. So to get away from that, she moved to Compton with my great aunt. And uh, good morning, and some uh, handouts. So she moved to Compton with her great aunt, and back in the day, Compton used to be a white city. It was all white, it was a suburb. Uh, I don't know if y'all know, but Compton got farms and farmland and all that stuff, you know, in it. So she moves to Compton, goes to Compton College. She's like highlighted in the news, like the first black student at Compton College, 1956 or whatever it was. And uh, so she fell in love with the community. She saw the white flight, right? Everybody leaving it because they, they were coming and uh, all of that. So by the time I came around, I'm the youngest. I got three older sisters, so I'm super spoiled. I think I'm, I'm the center of the universe everywhere I go because my three older sisters, I'm a mama's boy, so I got uh, coddled a lot. Still, I'm 50, but my older sisters will still like take care of me, but I like that, that's good. So anyway, uh, she wouldn't leave. So as we watched the degradation of Compton happen, my mom would always say, well, if we take the good families out the neighborhood, what's left? Like, mom, I don't know. But what I do know is you obviously don't want a son raising me in the hood, hood right? And that's something I realized at a young age that people would die. A uh, conversation I had last night about um, friends getting shot in the street, sorry. Uh, the coroner, LA County only had one coroner back in the 80s. So if your buddy got shot, they laid there all day. Right? What does that do to your psyche? For noon, the shooting happened Saturday at noon. Every 
sitting there looking at the body for eight hours. Now the cops come, but the cops ain't, they don't even cover the body up, right? It's a black man or a, a Latino male. So there was no value. And we would just sit there and watch. And then, you know, the mama tripping, the family members, everybody tripping. It's like this post-traumatic stress disorder that you are born and raised with, seeing that. And so I always told myself, that's going to be me one day. I said, I'm going to die like that. Like, I want to I have my eyes open. Or, like, I'm looking at the body and judging, like, okay, when I get shot, right? I don't want to, i got to make sure that if I'm conscious that I need to roll over or I need to close my eyes or whatever, just, just accept it, right? So think about growing up like that. Think about thinking that way as a middle-class kid, nerd, in the hood. Now, of course, I'm scary. Like, I wouldn't bust a grape in a fruit fight till, till today. So I knew joining the gang wasn't an option because I ain't about that life. I'm scary. I'm running. I'm not helping you fight nobody. What are we fighting for? Like, let's, let's chill, right? But it did something to me, right? That post-traumatic stress disorder still exists to this day. But I'm, I'm going to show you how I turned it around. Another thing that I had to learn was um, how to navigate. Right? So many hoods in Compton, right? And it ain't just Bloods and Crips, Red and Blue. That would be kind of easy to figure. But there are uh, hoods that wear yellow in Compton. There's a hood that wears green in Compton, right? Pyrus wear burgundy. There's a hood with black, right? So what color can I wear, right? Mom, so you got to get all these neutral colors. My mom in the springtime, I look like the, the Easter Bunny. I'm, I'm representing her with the pink today because I'd be going to school in Compton and like, pink little polos, mint green, baby blue, you know, all these colors and, and getting bagged on, of course, but you know, I had to learn how to bag, but I would have to walk to school. And inevitably, Compton to me is a small community, I gotta navigate through these neighborhoods, right? I have to make it through. I have to go, I live in the blood hood by Centennial High School, but Centennial High School was dangerous, so mom sends me, sends me to Compton High School, which depending on which route I take, is seven to 17 different neighborhoods I gotta walk through. Bloods, Crips, Latinos, right? It doesn't matter, it's, you name it. It was all, all there, crackheads, right? Uh, the rollers, the ones that ain't really affiliated with nothing, they anybody kill them. You know, they just out looking for something to do, get high on some sherm and out in the street. So I would always tell my mom, like I told y'all, you didn't want no son, <laughs> like you didn't, this wasn't part of your plan to have a, a male child here. You want to you want to come to my funeral. So we learned how to navigate. I learned where the safe corners were. I had three older sisters, which was a godsend because guys would like my sister. So I could go in certain hoods that they I would hear them talk about and hear the names that they say. Say, like, oh, you might know Big Face. Yeah, yeah, I know Big Face. How you know him? Oh yeah, he messed with my sister. Oh okay, okay, young blood, come on, walk, go through. And anybody that messed with you, tell them that I told them that you could walk through here. Right? So I had to learn where the power was. I had to learn where the safety was. I had to learn different routes to everything, right? And those things put in me this foundation of uh, being able to do certain things. Now, of course, now I stand before you. I'm Dr. Lincoln Johnson, right? When you got all these degrees and all this stuff, made all these moves in my life. But one thing that I learned from my superhero lifestyle was Link Johnson or Lincoln Johnson and Dr. Lincoln Johnson ain't never in the same room at the same time. People that meet Dr. Johnson, that's who they know. It's Dr. Johnson. People that know Link Johnson, you know, they might be a little embarrassed to say, but, right? That's who they know. And, and I'm never both of those in the same time, at the same place at the same time, right? And so those are the things I had to learn. Those are the things that I learned growing up in the neighborhood. I couldn't fake the funk. I'm not gonna be out here dressing like them or looking like them if I ain't one of them. I want it to be very clear that I am separate from that. And I had to learn that at a young age. So leaving Compton, I went to Morehouse College in Atlanta, Georgia. And I invite you men to do that. It's a, it's a great experience. I didn't have any brothers. So in the seventh grade, my mom would take kids from Compton all over the world, Mexico City, you know, Hawaii, wherever. Every year they do a trip and we have to do a, a report about where we were going. And so she'd take these kids to Compton. Some of them still to this day, I was their first and last time on an airplane, right? And they're adults, they're my age. And so we go to Morehouse and Spelman and Clark and all that, they're right there, right on the same block, pretty much. And I told my mom, this is where I'm going to school. I know you're not, my mom went to UCLA. Y'all could boo, I'm a, I'm a USC Trojan, so. 
<laughs> Y'all can believe she had to go to UCLA. <laughs> right. But, um, you know, she was helping on me going to UCLA. Like, no, mom, because I've been to UCLA. I've been to UC Irvine, UC this, Cal State that. And, I, and at the time, we were endangered species. You watch the news and the black man, the newest uh, member of the endangered species list. Most black men die between 14 and 24. Okay, noted, I'm going to die by 24. Let me go to Morehouse and get my degree. So then I can think and say I died and did something because at this point I'm still thinking it's, it's not looking good for me. I don't have any redeeming quality to make it so that I survive. So I get to Morehouse and I realize one thing immediately. Growing up in Compton, not having that fear of death or like the trauma and not letting that stuff stop me. Uh, one of the speakers said, like, do things and be afraid, right? I would do things and be afraid, because, like, this the end. So if I got to walk, I'm going to learn Atlanta. You know, I'm going to do everything I need to do before I'm out of here, because once I'm out of here, that's it. Game over, right? So I learned how to navigate the college. I needed to know. Same thing that I was doing in the streets of Compton, where the power was, where could I go to be safe? If I got a problem, who am I going to go talk to? Because I'm 3,000 miles from my family at this point. Right? And so I'm like, hey, that's the birth of the legend, right? I'm a superhero. Most people don't have the experience I got. This dude's at Morehouse Drive, Mr. T nephew, pulling up in the parking lot with a Ferrari. That dude ain't got my problem. I'm trying not to go back to the hood. I'm trying never to go back to Compton again. I'm trying to get an education and sick free myself from poverty, right? And from living like that. I don't want to do that no more in my life. So that's why I'm coming to college. But you know, you got this person, nephew. Denzel Washington's son, all these people that's going there that already made it. And so they don't have the problems that I got. They don't understand that life. They don't get that. You know, for a lot of us, we've seen our lives flash before our eyes too many times to count, right? And so that's how I started. I came back, I taught in Compton for a year. I hated teaching. I never thought I would be a teacher. Like to me, teaching college now is funny because I was a class clown, right? What, what was the point of learning if I wasn't going to use it, right? I went to Pace University in New York, got my uh, master's in publishing because I thought I'd live in New York and do that, but it didn't work out. I came back to Cali, Miss California, and uh, started started teaching. We got credentials. I got a special ed credential, English credential, and an admin credential at the California State University System, and then my doctor at USC. And so you should do that. Go to Morehouse and go to USC. <laughs> transfer, transfer, do that. Follow my steps. But anyway, I just say all that to say that we look at things like I hated growing up in Compton. When people would ask me where I was from when I'd be in other places, I'd be like LA. Because I thought LA had more, you know, sounded more middle class. I don't know what I thought. I just thought, let me I'm gonna tell people LA, right? And then I realized being from Compton was a thing, right? NWA was big, right? Everybody talking about Compton, DJ quit. I mean, I don't know how much y'all know about Compton, but then people start blowing up from Compton, like, oh okay, I'm from Compton. <laughs> I went to Compton High, right? But it's the set of skills that we learn, right? Because even now, it's not to say that challenges are not going to exist, right? You're going to have challenges because you are a black man or you are a brown man. You're, people are going to look at you. I could be an expert in my field. People challenge me all day with high school diplomas and a title and will tell me I'm wrong or challenge me or try to vilify me or whatever. But I've been shot at. I've been jumped. I've been jacked. So if you ain't about to do none of that in this office, this boardroom, or wherever we at, I ain't scared of you. I ain't scared of your title, right? And it gives you a skill. So at one point in my career, I said, you know what? I need to go help my people, my brothers, black and brown men that need to get it together and figure it out. Where I'm, I'm seeking out the worst ones. So I'm working in Compton, East LA, East Hollywood, Watts, South Central, Wilmington. I'm going into, I, I see a school on TV race riot at Locke High School. I'm working at Locke next year. <laughs> and I would go in and because I have now created this idea of being this legend, this superhero, this legacy, I go in with no fear. I'm changing cultures. I'm in the classroom. I'm teaching special ed. But I got students coming to me with all kinds of problems, right? Well, how do I fix this? Like, I don't know. But let me go to my back cave and figure it out, right? I got you. And so I kept looking for it. Worse off, I want to teach special ed. I want the students that get put in the bad class that look like us, right? I want that class. I want the class that teachers run away from, right? So in my career, I started building this legacy. People knew they would start calling me. Hey, we heard what you did at Locke High School. 
we heard what you did working for the county system. Can you come over here and do it? Like, no, all right. You invite a superhero. You know, I come, I take over stuff. And I was going to say that a little different, but I don't want to use no profanity today. I'm saying, <laughs> right? I come take over stuff. Right? <laughs> don't say that. Don't, don't get me started, man. <laughs> you hear right, right? And so I'd have to warn them because I don't have, I have no filter. Because unless you pull a Uzi out, I ain't scared of you. I'd have laid behind a tree while um, I, at, at Centennial High School, it's in the blood neighborhood, but two blocks away is the crib neighborhood. Like you're literally neighbors with the opposing gang and this high school sits on the line. They went to a funeral one day and decided they were just going to shoot up the football team at the high school. No, no gangsters, I'm, we just going to kill the football team. My fat, ass, my fat self. <laughs> all the skinny cats, all you running backs and wide receivers, I hate you cats. Uh, the quarterback, they hop the fence. They on the fence, they free. My fat ass can't get over that fence that fast. If I put my big body on that fence, they going to kill me. Because I hear them come around the corner like a war scene. I got a red backpack too. I'm about to die. This is it. This is it. <laughs> so I throw the backpack like it ain't mine, like they wasn't gonna pull up and see it. And I lay behind a palm tree. And I don't know, y'all seen palm trees in LA? It's, it's skinny, right? I'm fat, I'm like, half my body is on either side of the tree. I'm laying behind and the dude pull up and start shooting out the pathway. And I, it's like a movie. And I hear it, I'm like, oh my God. And that dude opened the door and the dude driving said, no, cuz. And he got back in. That dude saved my life. If I could find out where he is, I would give that man a hug. He saved my life that day. So it propels you. I want to work with students that's in those situations because I know what's up, right? That's where I'm from. And so that's what I did. I found, I started working at Locke, and then the state of California hit me up. We're in these lawsuits. We need you to come. And I, I don't know. You want me to come? You want me to work for the system? Like, if you're from the hood, you know that we have a healthy disdain for authority. A healthy disdain. I grew up in the uh, Rodney King era. Right? But I was happy that they showed that on TV. I thought something was really about to happen because we got to see it. But here we are years later, still happening, even though we can see it. But then, back then, I thought, got them, finally. Because this is what they do. This is how it happens, right? So I'm like, all right, I'm going to go work in the, in the prison system. But I started working with the youth. And uh, after about a year, my boss comes in and he says, you've been helping these kids 12 at a time, man. You need to promote to the adult prisons and help them 1,200 at a time. My ego love that. Like, yeah, I'm a superhero. I should. It's what I'm made for. I'm built for it. So I go down to Centinella State Prison in Imperial, California, level three or four institution with about 4,000 inmates in it. I went as what they call the supervisor of academic instruction. That's a vice principal. That's the best correlation that I could give you. And it was culture shock. 90 something percent of that prison being black and brown men still today we looked at a recidivism of seven out of ten come back within three years and the system was gaming on that right like well seven of them gonna come back <laughs> like yeah yeah we can make space now because seven of them gonna come back let them out they coming back right and it was culture shock and that put me into extra mode in six months i was running the school in that prison i made the, not made the the person, the supervisor of correctional education programs used to just sit in their office, wouldn't interact with the inmates. Like, you work in a prison. Lady, you like, you realize this is a prison full of people and you run the school. Like, you need to talk to them. You know? Spend eight hours in her office. So I just started doing stuff. I would go out and do the same thing, right? Navigate who I need to meet. Who the shot callers in this prison, first of all? I want to meet the shot callers. Because they the ones that's going to get everything I need done, done. I've seen enough prison movies to know. That's where, that's, where my, that's where my money lies, right there. So I'll go find the shot callers. I'll shot, find the cops that were about rehabilitation, because that ain't most of them. It's only about three of them. I'll find them. Influential people. I'll get in the chief deputy ward's ear, the ward's ear, and say, hey, man, you would look a lot better if you let me do this thing or that thing. I started working with Imperial Valley College, because my past ain't clean, my fingerprints ain't clean. Right? Sometimes as a superhero, you get your hands dirty. They even come after Superman for stuff. Right? You blow up a building, you got to face the consequences of that. And I'm trying to blow up the system. So, had some things happen, and uh, I, you know, I tell them, like, my past ain't clean. Right? And what I did, though, was I balanced my past 
with all these degrees. You can't deny my credibility. You can't deny my credentials, right? And so once they find out my fingerprints is dirty, they don't care because they love me. They want me there anyway. My track record ain't dirty, right? So anyway, um, started running the prison, brought in a college. I was trying to bring San Diego State in there. And then I realized that I wasn't gonna, there was no growth there. I, I had reached my peak, so I moved to California City Correctional Facility, which up in Kern County, Trump Country. I don't know if anybody from Kern County, I hope y'all don't mind me calling it that, but it is. <laughs> the Twilight Zone. Um, yeah. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yep, 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 up in the belly of the beast. And then I started really making moves, put the superhero stuff in action, right? I brought, I, Sarah Coso was already there. I made it, they were doing, you know, maybe 12 classes a semester. We got it up to 42, 45 classes. It was the best college program to me in the world, but I can, I can tell you confidently in the country, we had the best college program, 42 to 45 classes a semester with professors coming in and 1,000 students, it's 2,500 in that, in that prison. I had 40% of the prison in college. I was creating college dorms. Everybody wanted to be in college because they wanted to live in the dorm. They had an Xbox, you know, we let them touch the computer <laughs> and all of that. Right, broke records a couple of years doing the GED, right? But it was because I didn't have no fear, right? I was supposed to be dead by 24. And you, y'all, these people can't scare me, right? I'm gonna do what I want to do. So I want you to think about, think about your origin story, because it's something that you do. I work in prisons with felons, people that kidnap people, murder people, and do all that, and you know what? I tell them dudes all the time, y'all my heroes, yeah, you was a super villain before. But think about the organization it takes to commit some of them crimes, right? If you could read it, it would traumatize you further. Because it's like, man, you did all of that, and then made it to Mexico and was living there for three years, your homie snitched on you, would have been free. Now, what if you took them skills and used that to run a company? That same skill. You ain't got a bag, though. You ain't got to look over your shoulder. You ain't got to use the money that you make to get bail or, or leave the country. You can, it's just legalized. You could do all of that stuff just using those skills and trying to figure out what those things are. So I want you to do the same thing that we do in the prison, what I do with my students. I want you to think about some of your trials, some of your tribulations, your origin story, what makes you who you are. So I have the handouts in the back. I really kind of want you to write on there because we're going to share. I'm an English teacher, so I'm about writing and sharing. Sorry. Y'all got to deal with it. And I want you to think about after hearing my origin story, what is yours? What, are, what set of skills do you come with that will make you compete higher, right? Because we understand as black men, as brown men, black and brown women, right? We always have to do three times better. You know, some of y'all are young, you think you, it's an equal playing field, it's the 21st century, but that ain't the truth. You gotta figure out now, how do you stand up against the competition? Because it's always gonna be competition. A lot of times I feel like I'm the smartest person in the room when I'm in meetings. I get treated like the dumbest person, right? I end up having to <laughs> flaunt my arrogance, flaunt my superhero skills. So think about that. Take a few minutes and then we're going to share out once you do it and just jot down some ideas. Like what is it about you? Where did you grow up? What are some things that you know how to do that will set you apart from everybody else that you're going to be competing?
being a Spider Man, right? He just got bit by the spider. And they're like, Oh, I'm a Rob Banks. I'm a I'm a jack, you know, armored cars, right? I'm a, I'm a kidnap people. But he did. He decided to use it for good, so you gotta think about it. We all got it.
never had a wife. I, I became a mechanic. Automotive technician. I ended up getting hired by Porsche. I went through the ranks in like less than a year. Like he said, we're from the dirt. We're buried in the dirt. We have that big skin. You know, if you don't walk in with a gun, Yeah. It made me really resilient, you know, and it, for some of you that didn't grow up with that, you had your mom, right? Your mom was like, you gotta put your belt on, you better have that gun, you know what I'm saying? If they weren't coming at you with a belt or the back of a shoe, you'd be like, you gotta have it. So, anyways, I took, I took my experience, and just like I'm doing this today.
not a black president or a Mexican president. Or an Asian one for a fact. It's just like ridiculous. We got our own culture, a cultural center removed 10 years ago. And they're just like, we'll bring it back someday. But we never get past bringing it up. And they're like, oh, we'll talk about that for the next meeting. So, you know, I just ask my superpowers that I have that privilege where I'm in a position that allows me to advocate for students without having to be scared of something happening. But it's not at the same level, which as the African American community, I think it's like a different type of racism. So, yeah, <laughs> that's who I am, and that's my story, my superpower. So, thank you. So, now the tough part comes. The other handout you got is based on Joseph Kaplan's book, Hero's Journey. I found that to be very useful in my own journey with talking about things and what fights to take up. I don't know if you all like Dave Chappelle, but Dave Chappelle in one of his last specials he talked about not trying to take on the whole world, right? I needed to hear that because I think every problem is my problem. Black people, brown people, America, racism, slavery, police brutality. I want to fight all of that. I'm, I want all the smoke. <laughs> but it's too much. I can't do that by myself. I'm a martyr. I'm going to end up um, being where I am. So I want you to start your hero's journey, right? Here, you are here right now. Some of you guys, this is the first time you're hearing this concept of being a superhero. You are a superhero. Y'all are my heroes because I'm sitting in the room. I'm the only one. I'll be one of the brothers. Black, brown, yellow. I mean, even a cool white boy would be okay in this room. But I'm here by myself. I'm fighting the field, right? So I'm trying to inspire you to get out and use those superpowers, embrace that, right? You sit here in the in your ordinary world, right? You're Peter Parker on a school field trip, having just a regular day. Stuff is shitty, right? He's having a bad day, and a nuclear spider decides to bite him, right? And he has to decide what to do. That becomes your call to adventure. This here, right here, is your call to adventure. Help me not be the only problem. I gotta retire in a little while. I turned 50 yesterday. I'm gonna keep saying that. So y'all tell me happy birthday. I'm celebrating all week. This is a whole birthday trip, right? You got you're receiving this call to action today. You need to be doing something. Use those skills. You got you've identified it. Now take it and, and be face forward with it, right? Let people know who you are. Fight those fights that people are fighting, right? This is a direct threat to your safety, your family, your way of life, and the peace of the community. Right? I'm, I've always you know, watched people beat us down and kill us in the streets. I'm so tired of that. I get traumatized every time. I stop watching it. I can watch the whole um, uh, George Floyd video. I don't want to see nine minutes of that. I'm already traumatized. Right? Stuff is hard to watch. When they see us, that was hard to watch. Like, damn. Why? Why? Why are we still doing this? It's 2022, and they ain't had a president that was nothing else but what the main group is, right? And it's it's to be it's going to be like that. So this is your call to adventure, your call to action. Of course, heroes don't always just embrace that, right? When I was at Morehouse, I wanted to have fun. I wanted to try some weed, right? I ain't never smoked no weed. I ain't never done nothing. I've been a mama's boy all my life. Now I could be 3,000 miles away. I want to get in some trouble. I ain't trying to be no hero. I'm just trying to stay safe and stay alive long enough to get this degree and leave, right? So you refuse it at first. You're scared, right? Have second thoughts. I can't do it. It's too big for me, right? I'm not doing it. I was working in the prison system, like I told you, and I started seeing corruption. You know, I got health this day for authority. I don't really necessarily like the police. I grew up in the 80s and NWA straight out of Compton album. I still listen to. Them. I actually walk out the prison uh, rapping fuck the police, right? <laughs> to this day, when I have a good day, right? I'm strolling or limping out with my cane, rapping fuck the police because we did we did that, right? And so anyway, I would start seeing corruption. I'm like, man. I, just, I don't know what to do. I don't know what to tell you. Like, this is, these are the folks. This is what they do. That's what 5 0 do. That's what the ones do. You in here with them. It's your fault. You in here with them. But then I'm like, no, I got to do something, right? I met my mentor, another superhero, the 
Latina woman, a Latina, Latinx female, right? And she said, no, man, you got to do something. You got to say something. They all looking at you. You got 4,000 sons in here. I don't care if they're older than you or younger than you. These dudes looking up to you. They ain't never met nobody like you. Come from the hoods that they come from. And now you're running the school in the prison that they in. Like, dude, this is an opportunity. Let me, let me show you how to do it. Let me show you what I do at my college, right? And invited me over to Imperial Valley College to show me what that looks like, what being a change agent looks like, what being a superhero in real life looks like. Like, okay, now I'm empowered. Now I'm about to call the police on the police, right? And if you know from Compton, it's got to be a dire situation. I don't call 911. To me, that make it worse. I'm calling problems to whatever the problem is. So if I need an ambulance, we'll call 911 because we need an ambulance. Somebody's life is in danger. But otherwise, we're about to G this out. We're about to figure this out together. You see those movies like I Know What You Did Last Summer? They're like, let's not call the police. I'll be with them. Like, don't call them. Y'all all <laughs> going to prison. Y'all better fix it. Fix it how you fix it. Because to me, in my experience, when the police came, it always got worse. Then everybody is suspect. We can't even tell them what's going on. This person is hurt. This person needs help, right? Help this person. They ask him, who are you? What are you doing? Let me see your ID. Like, dude, could you help this person? Right, anyway. So I'm gonna call the police on the police. Who I call? Internal Affairs, okay. Who I call? The, the Inspector General. I would sit outside and take pictures of them, right? Because it's still dope. You, if you got family members in prison, it's still dope in there. They get the same dope they can get. They selling cell phones for $1,500, $2,000. In there, still a cash economy, even though they're not supposed to have no cash, all the things that you think. And you would think that they, they're manipulating people to bring it in, but no, 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 that's a business for some of these people. So I would sit outside and I'd take pictures of them. It's 100, take a picture of my console in my car, 107 degrees. This cop got on a coat, a cooler, and a backpack that's full. Now, I've known some boosters in my life. I grew up in Compton, and y'all know my path here ain't been a straight one. Link Johnson got some experiences. So I know what having a backpack full of stuff look like. I know boosters, and I know when they're carrying a lot of stuff, it make your back pop. So why he got he going to do an eight-hour shift? So I sit out, outside, I'm take pictures, I'm about seven, I'm about the same seven all the time, and I'm telling the inspector general, I'm doing all this stuff, I'm about to change the system, I'm a hero in there to the inmates. And then the, the cops hated me, right? They hit me up in the parking lot. What you trying to do? I'm trying to burn this MF down. I'm trying to make this though these dudes cannot come back here. This prison is useless. Y'all are making more criminals, more evil villains, right? I'm trying to make heroes. So you have to, I had to do it, even though it made me the martyr. I found myself in court. I called Internal Affairs and told them all the shit that was going on in that prison, and they started investigating me. I literally just had a hearing in January about lying about the color of a phone with Internal Affairs, the investigator of Internal Affairs and the Attorney General for LA County over the color of a folder. So I said in open court, all right, there are five cameras that I had to walk by. I said I had a red folder. The Internal Affairs investigator said, I didn't give him nothing at first, but then I gave him something, he didn't remember what color. Okay, if, the, if that's really important, let's look at the camera. I'm fat, I got a fake leg, I'm slow, so you gonna see my slew foot fat ass limping by with my cane, five cameras. And then tell me what was in my hand. It was about 1 20 in the afternoon. Oh, for some reason, from 1 o'clock to 2 o'clock, that it didn't record. <laughs> so we literally fight in court over the color of a folder. So, so are you saying, Inspector, that I lied about because dishonesty is you can get fired or whatever, you catch a, a case over lying in, in prison, being dishonest, dishonesty. So. That's the levels that you are fighting, right? Even doing great things. The governor's talking about my college program on Tuesday, and on Friday I'm sitting in court over lying about a photo, right? So the fall for grace is just like that, right? And that's the system. So then I had to cross the threshold, because now I'm mad. Right? And they, they riling up the inmates, because now the inmates trying to fight. And, and, and the first time in California Department of Corrections and Rehabilitation history, you got all the races fighting for this one person. Because it's divide and conquer, right? Uh, blacks and Asians are a group, and whites and Latinos are a group. So they keep them divide and conquer. That's how 200 officers can control 2,500, right? It's just a, a basic blueprint from slavery, right? Divide and conquer, how slave feels slave. 
and make them hate each other and fight, right? And then we ain't really got to police them. They're going to police each other because when the field slaves trying to do something, our slaves don't tell them. We don't know everything, right? And, and, and we could just monitor the house slaves because they're getting all the perks, right? So anyway, you cross the threshold. You're ready to act upon this call to adventure and begin the quest. So I'm hoping that that's what you're doing. All right, so you're gonna have tests, allies, and enemies. I walk in that place, I have all kinds of enemies. The inmates, these are level four fellas who ask me, how do you keep coming in here? You know they hate you. You know they be talking about you when you, when you be in here. They, they, we, we can serve for your safety, Dr. Johnson. I'm like, ooh, wait till I write the book. Wait till I write the expose about all the stuff I know. I could burn y'all ears right now. And as, we, as the conference going, come sit at the table with me. I'll tell you some crazy stuff that's happening under the guise of state government, right? You're out of your comfort zone. You're confronted with these series of challenges, right? Once I said, I'm going to do this, I'm going to change the culture of the Department of Corrections, became the villain, right? I work in a place for enemies. I'm an enemy of the state, literally, right now. And I ain't done nothing bad. Oh, I lied about the folder. I said it was red, but, you know, all education folders are red, just so you know. I didn't come up with red arbitrarily. My folder color is red at the prison. So why would I, why would I go, I'm not going to use this education folder that shows that it's education. I'm going to grab one from some other department. You need to approach Approach to the inmost cave that represents where it's terrible danger, right? I do feel fear sometimes. I have woken up in the middle of the night thinking like, yeah, I'm fighting the system. My eyes could be dead on one of these streets. Like, what about my kids? Thank you, what are you doing? Come on, superhero, right? So uh, you gotta face it, right? Or it's coming. The supreme ordeal is a dangerous physical test, something that happens, right? I'm gonna say that's my leg, y'all. I went to, I had, I had surgery number 14, they put a mega prosthesis inside my leg, I had a leg. And so then I decided I'm gonna go to South America. And in South America, that, that prosthesis was too heavy, it cracked my bone and it popped. I'm in the bed one night and it popped. And I decided like, that's it, okay. Number 15, y'all over 14 at this point. Number 15 is going to be the last time you cut me. <laughs> that is it, right? So that, imagine having a comeback like that, not whole, not a hundred. I don't have everything I was born with. I'm hurt, right? They didn't find my kryptonite. I can't walk. This is crazy, right? It's a whole different line of life to deal with, right? And then there's the reward at the end, right? Hopefully, after defeating the enemy, which I'm still in the middle of the fight, so I haven't defeated the enemy yet, but after defeating the enemy and surviving death, which most of us have done, overcoming personal challenges, we are transformed into something. But then you have to take the road back, right? I gotta come back and talk to y'all and let you know that that's out there. It's not gonna be easy. I'm an expert in my field. And like I said, I have high school people, high school diplomas that sit in the room with me, or even, you know, my father always talked about this idea of being an educated fool. I don't care how many degrees you get, just don't be an educated fool, like he would tell me. I could be sitting there with some educated fools, right? And I have to deal with it. So I'm by myself. I need other people to be inspired to be in there with me. So you need to return home with the reward, right? The anticipation of danger is, a plate with, is replaced with acclaim, vindication, and absolution. And then, of course, resurrection. This is where you'll have your final and most dangerous encounter with death, right? Um, Batman keep putting the Joker in Arkham Asylum. Batman don't kill the joker. Why he don't kill that fool? Everyone needs that, right? Right. Right? It's fine. Right? And so we have to, you have to think about that. And then the final stage, returning with the elixir. It's the final stage of the hero's journey. Son, 
baby child youngest of the family. That's all the culture. And I'm a geek. I like to watch it. Obviously, I'm doing a superhero thing, but I'm a superhero geek. I sit and watch the Marvel movies and do whole like mental dissertations on the Tesseract from the first movie, right? I'm sitting there, you know, and the Avengers that and my friends sit to me, right? Because every time I get together, I'm like, I know some people, we know some people, we in here with some people that are doing some things. And so when we get all together, I'm like, we like the Avengers. <laughs> we the Avengers, they're like, shut up. <laughs> you know, Avengers, you can barely walk, homie. Right? I'm, I'm the Avenger. Right? And then empowering yourself. We always supplicate, right? We get into places, and like one of the speakers said, we try to not shift the energy. We try to not be a threat. We try to not be intimidated. No, no, no. I walk in the room like that. I'm going to change the energy walking in the room. I'm gonna, you're gonna know who I am. You're, are you gonna love me or hate me? Ain't, ain't no in between. You either love that I'm in here, or every time I walk in, y'all gonna sigh. That's, the, that's what I'm looking for. I love that. That's the feedback I want. That means I'm doing something I'm supposed to be doing. Because I'm getting on your nerve. And you have, you have, you working with people that got the title, but they be incompetent. They be insecure. They ain't never got no Uzi shot at them. Sitting laying behind no palm tree. So they come over to scare. They don't wanna do their job. They don't wanna learn. They don't wanna do nothing. Cause waiting for retirement. No, I'm going to make some moves. You know, I'm going to do some things. I'm going to shift this river real quick. I'm going to make this well change direction while I'm scuba diving with it. Right? That's the challenge. I don't want to just swim in the open ocean. I want to mess with some fish. I want to get in their life and, and make them see me, right? And so you have to do that. And of course, your experiences. Take those experiences. Growing up in single parent households, the, the cultural, racial things that you go through, the challenges, the poverty, the hunger, and let that motivate you. That's a superpower. Ninety-seven percent of the people that you work with don't have those issues. They grew up and they knew what they was gonna eat every day. We talk about government cheese. It's probably the third or fourth reference of government cheese today. They ain't never ate that. They don't know what you're talking about. I was like, no, no, you just told me five pounds. Like, they don't eat We bought Tillamook cheese at my house. Like, well, we're lucky because that government cheese don't melt the same as that Tillamook. That's a, right. That's the Tillamook is the good cheese, right? Yeah. They don't know about that. So we're sitting here in Los Angeles, California, so we need to expand, right? I travel all over the world, you know, particularly the Pacific Rim, South America, Central America, the Caribbean, Asia, right? Africa. Go see those things and let that influence your culture. And if you're only hanging around with people that are just like you, then you're at a disservice. In my friend group, you know, there's Filipinos, Guatemalan, a uh, dude we call New Mexican who's in America with uh, imaginary line cross them. They didn't cross no border. The border crossed them, right? And so those people have changed my life and they've changed uh, how I view culture and the things that I do. So think about the world as a whole, right? You know, here on Success on Our Own, we all need each other. I need you. You need me. Uh, hopefully, I have inspired you to do better, right? And then, of course, just some. Um, Name. I'm on everything is Dr. Lane J. We're going to hear about it. I got a, uh, a little video blog of my leg journeys on YouTube. You go to YouTube, you'll see that. You'll see this again up there. Um, any other social media, go to Dr. Lane J. Go to Dr. Lane J. And if you find Lee Johnson, you might be Dr. Lane J. Not the super <laughs> Right? So thank you. Uh, uh, thank you for your time and attendance. I actually took y'all 10 minutes. I'm sorry I talked a lot. But it's okay. We got to meaningfully interact. Uh, are there any questions?
that made me have to have four more surgeries because the infection came back. So they did that. They put a prosthesis inside my leg. So I was supposed to last 10 years. And then um, that came loose in two and a half years. And they did the mega prosthesis. And it was supposed to last 35 years. It's what they do for cancer patients. But they don't, I'm going to say that they didn't see me as a human. They didn't think about what it would be like when I stood up on 250 pounds and started walking on that prosthesis, right? They just wanted to do it because they had never done it before. So they were trying some shit, and so 28 days later, it broke my leg. They, they didn't uh, bore it inside my bone oh. any though. And then I was like, cut it off. It took them three days. I was laying in the hospital for three days because they thought I had to go see the psychologist, the psychiatrist, they thought I was fetishizing being an amputee. Like, no, 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 this leg hurts. Take it off of me. I don't want to be in pain no more. You know, being depressed all that. So then um, I convinced them after three days to give me that, to have to take my leg. They took the guy in. And I'm like, I was being, I was mad at y'all. Since you in here to convince me to get this surgery where they're gonna take my hip out, they're just gonna build me a Lego leg, a titanium Lego, literally, and, and attach it to my hip. So the only thing that would be real is my pelvis and my ankle. But if something goes wrong, they're gonna cut my leg off at the hip, which is called a hip disarticulation. You wouldn't have your butt cheek and all that. Like, no, I'm not be doing that. Y'all 0 for 14. Something is gonna go wrong. So if you're basically telling me right now that you're gonna do a surgery and you cut my leg off at the hip, nope, you're gonna cut this leg off right now and they would not do it. They can put a made a decision. I keep telling you my decision. Fly me back to I was in uh, I was in South America, they flew me to Jamaica in the middle of a storm. That's how I know I'm a superhero. I'm here for a reason. We flew through a tropical storm in an air ambulance. You know, I might like, just get me back to America. That's the only time I missed America in my life. <laughs> save another American in Guatemala. So what you want to do? Like, let's take off. And if we crash, just make sure it's on the Florida side of this flight. <laughs> you know, just get me back home. So anyway, uh, they eventually cut it off. I stayed in Florida, Miami, Florida for like three weeks and then came home. Now I'm, I'm happy. You know, they, they think I'm a trip. I'm going to these appointments. And usually people are depressed. I talk to a lot of amputees. You know, be careful on motorcycles if you have a motor motorcycle. About 66% amputees uh, have been on motorcycles. My sister, my sister got, my mom said we waited till 40 to start messing ourselves up because she got fake shoulders, hips, knees, and ankles from a motorcycle crash. Yeah. So that's it. <laughs> All right, fellas, ladies. I wrote, a, I wrote an English textbook. I got some writing stuff. Uh, check me out. Check me out. I'm writing a book about the prison system. And I'm, but I got to move. I got to go live in. Next time. Next
next time, next time. <laughs> Thank you. 